Today, I want to chat with you about markets and food technology saving the world. I was going for understatement with this talk title. How'd I do? I want to start by polling the audience. Who here likes pasta? Yeah, pasta! Um, I think I got unanimity on pasta. Who here would go to your refrigerator, take out eight plates of pasta, dump them in the trash, and eat one plate of pasta? Can't see so well in the face of the lights, but I don't think anybody in this audience raised their hand. At a uh, festival called Change Food Fest, I'm guessing that everybody in the room is concerned about food waste. And yet, it's worth noting that food waste is responsible for about 40% about of everything that we grow, we end up throwing away. And obviously, that is a huge problem. But each time we funnel crops through animals, the problem is even worse, because it takes about nine calories into a chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of the animal's flesh. It is a vastly inefficient system. I weigh about 185 pounds. If I do nothing but lay in bed watching reruns of The Apprentice, I'm gonna burn like 2,000 calories a day. Except when I get excited, I'm fire him, Donald, fire him! You know, then it's gonna tick up a little bit. That same sort of inefficiency is true for farm animals as well. And that's just one of the harms that we're supporting if we're supporting animal agriculture. Animal agriculture entrenches global poverty, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for global health, and it's bad for animals. The first one, entrenching global poverty. This is Jean Ziegler, former UN Special Envoy on Food. A number of years ago, Ziegler called biofuels a crime against humanity. And he called them a crime against humanity because he looked at a UNFAO report that found that about 100 million metric tons of corn and wheat are go into biofuels, drives up the price of food, entrenches global poverty. That same UN FAO report found that farm animals consume about 756 million metric tons of corn and wheat. This doesn't even include the 200 million metric tons of soy that farm animals consume. The World Watch Institute summed it up this way. They said, continued growth in meat output is dependent on feeding grain to animals, creating competition for grain between affluent meat eaters and the world's poor. So the way that we're producing food entrenches global poverty. It's also bad for the environment. Obviously, if you have to grow nine times as much of something, that's going to be environmentally problematic. But it's actually a lot worse than that. We're growing the crops, we're shipping them to a feed mill, we're operating the feed mill, we're shipping the feed to a factory farm, we're operating the factory farm, we're shipping the animals to a slaughterhouse, we're operating, and so on. Every stage is both polluting um, and resource depleting. The United Nations released a report called Livestock's Long Shadow. They said animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every stage from local to global. Animal agriculture contributes to problems of land degradation, climate change and air pollution, water shortage and water pollution, and loss of biodiversity. And finally, animal agriculture causes more climate change than all forms of transportation combined. Chicken is the least climate change inducing animal, and yet chicken on a per calorie basis produces 27 times as much CO2 equivalent as legumes like peas or soy. And if what you're going for is protein calories, it gets even worse, 40 times as much on a per, per protein calorie basis. The foremost think tank in Europe is Chatham House, also called the Royal Institute of International Affairs. They said it is a literal impossibility, scientifically not possible, that we will keep climate change to under two degrees Celsius by 2050, the goal of the Paris Agreement, that we will keep climate change to under uh, two degrees Celsius by 2050 unless animal product consumption goes down. It's stagnating in the developed world, but it's going up in the developing world. We need to do something to solve the problem. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this other than to say uh, animal agriculture is also a big problem for the animals involved. More than nine billion land animals and even more sea animals in the United States. Every one of them is an individual. It's no more acceptable to harm a pig like Linus than it would be to harm a cat like Rena. And then finally, uh, global health. Also not, also not gonna spend a lot of time on global health other than to say that animal agriculture um, could be ushering in a new bird flu or other zoonotic disease. And in the United States, about 80% 
of all antibiotics that are produced by pharmaceuticals are fed to farm animals. It is creating antibiotic resistance. It is creating superbugs. And animal agriculture may be ushering in an end to antibiotics working in human medicine. So what's the solution? At the Good Food Institute, we agree with Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Alphabet. Eric Schmidt, about six months ago, was asked to talk about technological innovations that he feels will improve life for humanity by a factor of at least tenfold in the fairly near future. The first thing he talked about was plant-based meat. This is Beyond Meat's uh, plant-based chicken strips. When Bill Gates tried these, he said, what I just tasted was not just a clever meat substitute, it was a taste of the future of food. So when Eric Schmidt was talking about this, he was talking about delivering high-quality protein to the developing world, and he was talking about climate change and plant-based meat. But we also at the Good Food Institute recognize what the journalist Marta Zaroska talked about in her book, Meat Hooked, the history and science of our 2.5 million year obsession with meat. And that is that whether it's psychological or physiological, there are an awful lot of people who simply aren't going to recognize that as meat, no matter how good it is. So at the Good Food Institute, what we're going for is creating both the plant-based meats that can compete with animal-based meat on the basis of price, taste, and convenience, the actual factors that everybody considers when they're figuring out what it is that they're going to eat. But we're also very excited about cellular agriculture, about clean meat. And this is the first clean meat hamburger. It's produced by taking actual animal cells, bathing them in nutrients, putting them on a scaffold, putting them into essentially a meat fermenter and growing meat, but in a far more efficient, far less climate change inducing, no animals harmed, no antibiotics required way. A Couple years after the first clean meat hamburger, we got the first clean meat meatball, uh, a company in Silicon Valley called Memphis Meats. That's their clean meat meatball money shot. And that's a slide which explains why we're calling this clean meat instead of cultured meat or something else. What you can see is, in terms of both antibiotics and bacteria, if you're talking about conventional pork or conventional beef, you have both antibiotic residues and you have high levels of E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and other bacteria. On organic pork and organic beef, you don't have the antibiotics, but you still have the bacteria. So clean meat, it is clean. It doesn't have the bacteria. Also a nod to clean energy. It's clean because it's environmentally so much better. And it is the exact same thing, just produced in a different way. This is what clean meat production will look like. So picture a modern factory farm, picture a modern slaughterhouse. This is what clean meat production will look like. People will basically be going down to their friendly neighborhood meat brewery. Fortune Magazine called clean meat the hottest tech in Silicon Valley, not the hottest food tech, the hottest tech. This is what annual revenues look like for plant-based meat and clean meat once they get to parity with milk. Right now, plant-based meat is under $500 million against a $200 billion per year meat industry. Just getting to parity in terms of percentage of market with plant-based milk, we go up to a $20 billion per year industry. If we get to one-third, we get to $65 billion per year, and the meat industry is taking notice. This is the January issue of Meeting Place Magazine. In the January issue of Meeting Place Magazine, the editor's letter encouraged the meat industry to refashion itself as protein delivery and to move into both plant-based meat and cellular agriculture. To the degree that they've weighed in, Purdue, Hormel, and Tyson have all made positive noises about the idea of both plant-based meat and about clean meat. And I wanna end by flashing back 125 years. The year is 1894, and out on the streets of New York City, there are 175,000 horses these horses are excreting 50,000 tons of manure every single month. In 1898, the world's first conference, the world's first urban planning conference happened. The only item on the agenda is what do we do about all the horse shit? <laughs> the streets of not just American cities, but other cities as well, they were drowning in horse manure plagued by flies, congestion, carcasses, and traffic accidents. The Urban Planning Conference was called off. They couldn't figure it out. Everybody just went home, despondent. <laughs> 10 years later, 1908, Henry Ford introduces the Model T, and six years after that, there are more cars than horses on the streets of New York City. Animal agriculture is a really big problem 
in terms of how we feed 9.7 billion people by 2050. It's a really big problem in terms of water use, water pollution, loss of biodiversity, chopping down the rainforest, and the existential threat of climate change. It's a really big problem for global health, and it creates a living nightmare for tens of billions of animals. I'm absolutely convinced that in the not too distant future, we're going to see the idea of growing massive amounts of crops to feed them to animals so that we can eat those animals as completely absurd in the same way that we would see it as absurd that anybody in this room would walk out onto the street and hop on a horse to go back to Washington DC or Chicago or San Francisco. Just as absurd. Markets and food technology, they're gonna save the world. Thank you.